I have with me today Mr. Ashok Mukherjee. He's been India's ambassador at the United Nations in New York, and he has also served in various diplomatic postings in Moscow, Washington, D.C., Geneva. He had also opened the Indian embassies in Tajikistan and other places. Welcome to the print, sir, and thank you for talking to the print. Uh, thank you, Nal Nima. I'm happy to be on your uh, program today. Thank you, sir. So we'll uh, def definitely discuss the Ukraine war, what is going on, the discourse. Uh, it is, the war is sort of intensified. Uh, it's not really what probably uh, countries have assumed that, you know, it will be over in probably a week or maybe five days. But we can see that probably we are headed for a protracted war. But um, the in this entire discourse what has come to light is the role that the united nations play in it um and of course with that the position that india has taken sir so my question to you would be to to understand in situations like this how does the un uh, i mean what is the basic ethos on which the united nations should be working and of course i'll discuss of other countries and india's uh, later on well, uh, yes, uh, war and peace uh, are issues which uh, are in internationally covered by the United Nations Charter. Uh, the famous words in the uh, preamble uh, of the Charter to, su to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. So that is the objective for which the United Nations was established. And I think that uh, countries which uh, founded the United Nations, which include India, uh, contributed uh, to, uh, to implementing this vision of the UN Charter, because all of us have uh, gone through uh, terrible uh, conflicts uh, before the United Nations was created. Uh, 2.5 million Indian soldiers fought in the uh, Allied armies, which emerged victorious and created the United Nations. So we are a stakeholder and we have given our own blood for creating the United Nations. So that is the uh, conception on which the United Nations approaches issues of war and peace. And uh, to, uh, to make sure that uh, the principles of the charter are implemented, the United Nations gives a mandate to the UN Security Council, uh, which uh, when it was established in 1945, had uh, five uh, self-selected uh, permanent members who were uh, to perform the role of what was called policemen of the world. Uh, and these were uh, the Republic of China, uh, France, uh, United Kingdom, United States, and Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, uh, who were the uh, victor, victors of uh, the Second World War. And uh, the United Nations Security Council uh, in the beginning uh, had uh, six elected members without very clear geographical uh, representation. That evolved in time, and uh, when the Security Council was reformed for the first and only time in its history in 1963, four more uh, elected members were added. So today you have 10 elected members and five uh, self-selected permanent members. So that is the body which is supposed to implement the principles of the Charter and maintain international peace and security. So uh, there's another uh, uh, provision in the Charter uh, for a role of the United Nations in uh, anticipating and preventing uh, wars and conflict, and that is Article 99, which gives the United Nations Secretary General a mandate to bring to the attention of the Security Council any situation he feels or she feels is uh, a threat to international peace and security. And under that, uh, some Secretary General, Secretaries General have acted to, uh, to initiate preventive diplomacy. So you have these two bodies uh, which uh, the Security Council and the, and the Secretary General, who have a role given to them in the United Nations Charter. But my question to you is basically to understand the language of the res resolutions which India is voting for. Do you think uh, those are the right kind of tone and the language the UNSC or the UNGA is adopting? Well, I think here, when you look at resolutions of the United Nations, First, of course, for issues of war and peace, the resolutions are in the Security Council because of the role uh, given to the Security Council by the UN Charter. The Charter also says that any issues considered by the Security Council cannot be uh, considered by the General Assembly. Article, there's an article in the Charter which says that. So basically, the responsibility is on the UN Security Council. 
Now, uh, India can, uh, has gone by her own experience. This is the eighth time that we are sitting inside the Security Council as an elected member. And uh, our experience has shown that uh, if the Security Council uh, uh, tries to uh, support uh, preventive diplomacy or diplomacy and dialogue to uh, bring a conflict to an end, then that approach is much more sustainable in the sense that there will be peace on the ground than uh, an attempt to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to adopt a resolution or to uh, propose a resolution which uh, would appear not to take into account the uh, legitimate interests of both uh, uh, parties or more parties to, the, to any conflict. Uh, but having uh, drafted a resolution in the Security Council, uh, the, the fate of that resolution goes out of the hands of the drafters and uh, comes up against the, uh, the realities, the political realities of the members of the Security Council. And India's own experience has, has been the same. I mean, uh, we uh, put a complaint in, uh, in 1948, January, on the violation of our territorial integrity and sovereignty in, uh, in Kashmir to the Security Council on the 1st of January. By the time the Security Council took a decision on this, uh, it converted the dispute that we had, uh, the, 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 the issue that we had put to the Security Council of territorial integrity and sovereignty, it converted that into what it called the India-Pakistan question, which was uh, uh, for India uh, uh, completely unexpected because uh, instead of territorial integrity and sovereignty, we were now being asked to participate in Security Council discussions on a principle on which the partition of India had taken place. And that was only the partition of British India, not even uh, applicable to the princely states of India, including Jammu and Kashmir. So this was the experience that we underwent. And uh, it's, uh, I mention it because uh, what the Security Council does uh, is driven by the interests of its, of its members, especially its five permanent members. And that is because the five permanent members gave to themselves the right to uh, disagree on any proposal that comes into the uh, uh, council uh, agenda. And this right, which is known as the right to veto, was not negotiated when the United Nations was established. It was, it was agreed to by the five permanent members in, uh, in February 1945, before the UN was created, and made a condition for countries who came to negotiate the UN Charter in San Francisco from April to June that year. And, and it, the invitation letter, which was signed by the permanent members, specifically said that you cannot reopen the veto uh, privilege that we have given to ourselves. So that was the basis on which the UN Charter was created. And when India had this experience, which I uh, referred to about our own uh, 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 issue of uh, violation of territorial integrity and sovereignty, we could not change the discussions in the Security Council, even though in 1950 and 51, uh, we were elected for the first time as members of the Security Council, but India could not influence any discussion because it was dominated by the veto uh, power of the five permanent members. So I think that that was one example that we have. Then, of course, uh, there's a very uh, uh, a so sad but a mirror image of what is happening today in December 1971, and um, uh, many people may not remember, but when uh, the armed conflict started on the 3rd of December when Pakistan declared war on India, then on the 4th of December, the United States proposed a, a resolution in the Security Council calling for a ceasefire for withdrawal of armed forces and a role for, of the United Nations. But the, the, the draft of that resolution did not address the issue which India had been agitating, which was the need for a political settlement in East Pakistan to bring this entire issue uh, uh, to a, a resolution. And it was because the political settlement was not contained in that resolution that uh, India, of course, was not a member in 1971, December of the Security Council, but uh, the USSR, uh, uh, acting in concert with India, vetoed that resolution three times. It was prepared and every th time it was prepared without the political settlement uh, provision in it. So the point is that unless you address uh, the sustainability of war and peace, which is through political dialogue and settlement, these resolutions uh, cannot uh, really be, uh, be accepted by all the five permanent members. And in the case of the Ukraine resolution, it's the same. There is no prioritization of a dialogue and a political settlement. It is one thing to uh, call it an invasion. 
it is another thing to uh, talk about the withdrawal of forces and it's another thing to uh, say that there should be some role for the united nations but until the situation on the ground uh, which has triggered this dispute uh, has uh, also a political solution offered in the resolution that resolution uh, cannot be uh, adopted and unfortunately that is what has happened in the case of the resolution which was proposed uh, on the situation in ukraine and i uh, think that this is also a reflection on the inability of the permanent members to handle the issue because the uh, this the war that has begun in ukraine actually had a history which uh, the, this security council has handled in not long ago in 2015 in 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 2015 uh, a political settlement for ukraine's uh, problems was uh, negotiated and signed uh, under the guarantee of France, which is a permanent member of the Security Council, and Germany, and Russia, which is another permanent member of the Security Council, and it was endorsed by the Security Council. So there is a, a framework political settlement for the problem in Ukraine. But this was not implemented for reasons which are not clear to the rest of the international community. And instead, now we have a situation where there is a conflict, which was actually uh, you know, uh, inevitable. Because without a political solution, you'll always have uh, uh, some uh, situations on the ground which uh, are, are, are the triggers of violence and conflict. So these are the examples that uh, one can give when looking at uh, the way the Security Council approaches uh, these uh, resolutions. Now, the reason why Security Council resolutions are important uh, from the legal perspective is that the Charter of the United Nations is a treaty. It, it, it is not a, just a document of good intentions. It's a legal treaty. And uh, under Article 25 of the Charter, all decisions of the Security Council have to be accepted by all members uh, of the United Nations who have signed that treaty. So it's an obligation. It's not, it's not just a good uh, effort intention. It's an obligation. And uh, therefore, the adoption of a resolution is actually very, very important. Of course, uh, there are two kinds of resolutions, uh, depending on which uh, part of the United Nations Charter they are brought under. In the case of the Kashmir resolution that uh, was tabled in and adopted in 1948, it was under Chapter 6, which is uh, titled the Peaceful Settlement of Disputes. So for that, you have a whole process of how step-by-step -step negotiations take place and so on. Uh, but in the case of the uh, recent resolutions, it was proposed under Chapter 7, which uh, gives the United Nations Security Council the power to also apply economic or military measures to enforce the resolution. And when this draft resolution was tabled, uh, if you remember, uh, th there was some discussion between the members of the Security Council, and the reference to Chapter se uh, 7 was dropped uh, by the United States, which had drafted the resolution, mm -hmm. and Albania and uh, in an attempt to accommodate these other members. But I think that because uh, things were happening very fast, very quickly, the, uh, the, the time and energy and effort needed to actually agree on a diplomatic uh, compromise uh, uh, revolving around a political settlement was not uh, sort of done. And therefore the resolution was vetoed. Uh, now, when people talk about uh, the General Assembly resolutions, the General Assembly resolutions, uh, first of all, if the issue is uh, being handled by the Security Council, the General Assembly is not supposed to uh, consider it at all. That's a clear article in the UN Charter. Okay. But in 1950, uh, when the Korean War was taking place, there was a situation where uh, the USSR uh, was uh, blocking uh, Security Council action uh, on uh, the Korean conflict uh, because they had insisted that the People's Republic of China should be made a member of the United Nations and Sec Security Council in 1950. Yes. Uh, when that was not agreed to, the, the, so the, the Soviet delegate walked out of the uh, Security Council and created a window uh, when there was no decision taken by the Security Council. And uh, and that opened uh, a window for uh, a resolution to be uh, adopted by the General Assembly, saying specifically that uh, an issue of war and peace is not being handled because of the block uh, in the Security Council by the veto of a permanent member, and the General Assembly should unite uh, for peace to uh, propose a uh, set settlement. And that's the uniting for peace resolution. 
of 1950 that was applied in the korean uh, war case and then subsequently seven uh, more times subsequently including the israel palestine issue and now for the ukraine uh, conflict again uh, the issue was referred under this uniting for peace resolution to the general assembly so that uh, called okay, for a so debate that, that yeah. is the reason they said that the russia would not be able to veto it this time that's right and uh, a general assembly resolution uh, cannot be vetoed because in the general assembly it's democratic decision making each country has one vote and there is no veto so that is actually the objective of people like uh, who want to reform the security council they also want to replace the veto with majority voting but mm -hmm. none of the five permanent members agree to that because it will take away the privilege they have given to themselves in 1945 now uh, in the general assembly resolution it, it, even if when it is adopted it is recommendatory it is not legally binding under the charter so mm -hmm. it is it has more of a moral uh, impact rather than a legal impact, legal impact. and uh, countries of course have always got the right to take collective action uh, for self defense under article 51 and some countries will introduce unilateral measures like sanctions under you know under the these rights that they have in the charter but uh, none of these uh, sanctions can be considered to be united nations sanctions until they are in, uh, adopted as part of the security council resolution so therefore they are not binding on all members of the united nations either mm -hmm. and i think that that is what you will see uh, in the case of the sanctions on ukraine these have been applied by the uh, g7 countries and some of their uh, developed country partners but the vast majority of developing countries and uh, other countries in the world have not and there's a map which uh, is uh, available on social media which shows you uh, the spread of uh, where the sanctions uh, are not being i mean which countries are not applying these sanctions that were announced uh, unilaterally by the G7 and their developed country partners so that is the general assembly resolution and that is how it's different from a security council resolution mm -hmm. uh so then also this time uh, the question that again is coming up is why is india constantly abstaining uh i mean it is it is as you said has been part of the uh, the the 15 that are non permanent members but then the question that has uh, come up is that if you consider yourself to be a like minded democracy and other things why is it that at the un uh, you are abstaining from this voting process also an attached question to is this will that impact um, the larger relations that we have the bilateral relations that we have uh, especially with the us well i think again uh, there are two uh, perspectives from which this uh, issue can be answered the first is our national experience and i've given you the way uh, this issue was handled in 1971 uh, when uh, india was completely isolated for having taken military action in east pakistan uh, which led to the uh, emergence of and uh, liberation and emergence of bangladesh and at that time the general assembly resolution uh, uh, was adopted by 104 countries out of 131 members at that time and there were only uh, 10 countries which supported india's point of view now and that uh, conflict uh, india's point of view was also that the, the political settlement in east pakistan was very uh, critical uh, and it was critical because without that settlement 10 million refugees had come into india so we uh, our permanent representative summer sen in his speech in in the united nations general assembly had called it refugee aggression now uh, that uh, led to the intervention and probably uh, for uh, people who uh, look at these things uh, in today's perspective that was one example of a humanitarian intervention by a member state of the united nations uh, invoking article 55 of the charter which summer sen did uh, and and calling for collective action under article 56 which he also invoked and it was all in the general assembly we were not members of the united nations security council that time so uh, we did this and then having completed the humanitarian intervention we also withdrew within 3 months and by april uh, there were no more indian soldiers left in bangladesh and it was uh, you know left for bangladesh to to uh, to to run its own uh, own country now uh, that is something that india has done so uh, when we look at what is happening in, in ukraine today and when we uh, understand as sitting in the security council that there has been a lack of responsibility on implementing and ensuring the implementation of the minsk agreement which was the political settlement in 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 ukraine then 
uh, for us, uh, the, the question becomes open-ended because the question is, even if there's a conflict, how will this conflict be ended? This conflict can only be ended with a political settlement. And that settlement has to be sustained. So therefore, it has to have an endorsement of the UN Security Council uh, through a resolution, which means that you'd have to have all the five permanent members agreed on a settlement in Ukraine. Otherwise, it will be one of those frozen conflicts without which will go uh, which go on for for years on end i mean we have seen uh, conflicts going on in uh, in trans the nister uh, part of moldova or uh, uh, in in cyprus there's a conflict which is going on uh, since 1974 and so on so these conflicts until they are resolved through a political settlement uh, uh, so that was one reason for for india the other perspective for India's position is that uh, most people forget that you know India is of course elected as a non uh, permanent elected member of the Security Council, but who elected India? India was elected as a representative of the 54 countries of the Asia Pacific region, right? And uh, therefore, apart from India's following her own national interests, which I've all just described to you. There is also the element of India having to take in, on board the, uh, the views of the Asia Pacific 54 countries who have elected India to represent them in the Security Council. And if you look at the co-sponsorship of the resolution that was vetoed, out of the 54 countries of the Asia Pacific region, only five countries uh, co-sponsored that resolution. The, the vast majority of the Asia Pacific region did not co-sponsor that resolution. So therefore, for India to have taken a position uh, as a parliamentary democracy, we know the importance of constituencies and uh, reflecting the, the, the issues of our constituencies in our own domestic politics. So therefore, we have to apply the same democratic principles in the United Nations Security Council. After all, we are democratically elected, unlike those five countries which are not elected at all. So therefore, we have to hold ourselves to our own standards in terms of the, 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 the United Nations uh, sort of operating on the basis of one country, one vote. And we have to take a, 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 a account of our own constituencies things. So in the General Assembly resolution that was um, adopted, and 141 countries voted in favor of it, 35 abstained, and four countries voted against it, uh, along with Russia. Now, if you take those 35 countries which abstained, again, you'll find that the vast majority of those countries are from the Asia Pacific region. So it is uh, not uh, sustainable to say that India is acting against uh, uh, world opinion. India yes. is reflecting the opinion of the Asia Pacific region. And mm -hmm. we do not want conflict because the 21st century, if it is to be an Asian century, requires a supportive international environment of peace. Otherwise, how will this century become an Asian century if uh, all the uh, uh, connective, connected tissues of our international relations are impacted by war and conflict? So I think that this is uh, uh, how I would uh, uh, respond to that question which has been raised. Mm -hmm. So then also, uh, as I asked you, does it impact our bilateral ties with the US? So you think the US understands uh, where India is coming from and also the fact that if you uh, sort of tinker more with it, then that entire question opens up the Pandora's box, so to say, of reforming the UN Security Council. Yes, I think the United States and India actually have had a long partnership. I mean, people must remember that uh, during the Second World War, when India joined the initiative to create the United Nations, which was floated by President Franklin Roosevelt, we called the Washington Conference in January 1942. He invited India, although we were a colony, to participate on an equal basis in that conference. And we signed that uh, declaration of United Nations issued by that conference. So we were among the 26 countries. And I think he took a uh, considered view to invite India, despite the objections of the British uh, uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill. So our relationship with the United States goes back to that founding moment uh, when we were fighting together in the war. And we were also uh, working together in, the, in, in this, uh, in this uh, enterprise of creating the United Nations. Now, in the war, uh, the India and the United States in the Second World War collaborated very closely together. And that is well known in the campaign in, in, in the ground campaign in Asia uh, under General Stilwell. Uh, these are recorded in military history. I don't have to give you many details, but the, even the nugget that I can share with you that uh, it was in Ramgarh, uh, where the Sikh Regimental Center headquarters are in 1942 onwards, 
that uh, the United States uh, army instructors trained uh, soldiers from the Republic of Chinese army in India to fight in, uh, uh, against Japan in the Second World War. So that's the kind of relationship that we have had. And uh, in 1948 to 1954, when the Kashmir issue came into the Security Council, uh, the United States and India actually worked very closely together. You have to just read the records of that period. And when Dr. Graham, the American, who was appointed the envoy of the Security Council to implement that uh, resolution calling for a plebiscite, when he engaged with India and Pakistan uh, uh, for a fairly long period of time, it was Dr. Graham who reported to the Security Council in 1954 that there is no way of implementing this resolution because Pakistan refuses to vacate the aggression it has committed in, in Kashmir. So without the vacation of, uh, of, of that territory, the plebiscite uh, was uh, not, not possible. And that's where the Security Council closed that discussion. So again, it was United States and India working together. But then the Cold War, which then took over the relationship in a certain or cast a shadow on the relationship, that put us against each other. And frankly, I think we must remember 1971, we were a country threatened by nuclear weapons by the United States when the USS Enterprise was ordered by President Nixon to uh, come to the Bay of Bengal. That was the largest nuclear capable ship of the United States Navy, Navy. And it was in the Bay of Bengal implicitly threatening India and calling on India to stop the military campaign in, in, in Bangladesh. So we have gone through these uh, issues. And I think that when you see the, the, the statement of the US uh, State Department spokesman that uh, they know that India has its own interest and they are uh, not going to do, uh, uh, they are not going to make it a litmus test of this black and white approach otherwise of you are with us or you are against us. They know that India is too big. India is not a member of any military alliance. So they'll have to deal with India on, in, on its own terms. And the strength of the India-US relationship today actually is, uh, is an insurance, if I may call it that, for any uh, people who want to box India into an, a kind of uh, black and white uh, alliance uh, syndrome. Because uh, we represent one fifth of humanity and we okay. need to join any alliance only through our own democratic process. We have gone through colonial rule. We do not want new colonial rule again. So I think that's how the, I would answer that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you think this Ukraine war has sort of uh, again opened that debate that yes, there should be a larger say of other countries within the UN Security Council, basically uh, UNSC reform. And also another thing that is coming up that we get to hear these days uh, from a lot of opinion makers is that uh, why not Russia also remove uh, as one of the P5 countries? Is that is that possible? Uh, how does all this work, sir? Well, I think again, I, I, you know, I think these things need to be taught in our educational institutions, and uh, but they are available in the records. These are diplomatic records, historical records. They are 30 years old, so all the more reason for educational institutions to actually retrieve them and teach them. Because I think uh, the, the answer to that last question that you asked is actually very clear, that when the USSR uh, uh, dissolved in December 1991, all the countries which were present in Alma Ata, uh, which took the decision to dissolve the USSR, okay. they signed uh, a document which, uh, which designated the Russian Federation as the continuing state of the USSR. So this whole, uh, uh, what is a continuing state? In the, and, and if you look at the diplomatic history, in the United Nations system, the first time a continuing state came in was actually India. Because when India was partitioned by the British into India and Pakistan, then the question was that would both countries have to reapply for membership of the United Nations? And in 1947, the decision of the United Nations was that no, India is the continuing state. And it's Pakistan which has to apply for membership, which Pakistan did and got in, uh, in, in September uh, uh, 1947. So that is the, the history and that is the legal precedent. So for someone to say today that no, we have to uh, ask Russia to remove itself from the Security Council, etc., is uh, it goes against both the 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 the, the 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 legal perspective as well as what happened. Ukraine was one of the countries which signed that letter agreeing to Russia as the continuing state. So it's very difficult for someone 30 years later to say that uh, that that's uh, that uh, we have to throw Russia out because it, it doesn't is not entitled to the seat of the USSR. There's a document uh, which was circulated to all member states in the, in the UN in 1991. And that document was not objected to anybody, by, uh, to by anybody. 
and therefore in in law there's also this thing with you know if you speak you speak but if you don't speak then that also is your position that you have uh, you have closed that issue and 30 years is a very long time uh, so i don't think that the issue can be reopened and uh, frankly uh, the issue of un security council reform in a sense and is very tragic that the, it takes a conflict to bring uh, to the forefront the issues but there are people uh, from india uh, including me who have argued and have uh, spoken extensively in the un general assembly calling for un reforms uh, which are agreed to on all five areas and one of the areas is the use question of the veto so we have given our view on on this in public in the negotiations but uh, none of the five permanent members want to engage in this negotiation you know even uh, the united states which committed in the parliament of india when president obama came for making india a permanent member of the reform security council if you look at the records of the negotiations of the intergovernmental negotiations in the general assembly you will have to look like uh, for a needle in a haystack to find where uh, the united states has taken leadership on 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 delivering on this promise and uh, the same applies to all the other uh, permanent members it's not only the united states and that is the point that none of them want to give up the privilege that they acquired without negotiating it for being there permanently which was never uh, on the basis of elections and for having the veto power which was again never negotiated and i think that uh, again uh, to answer this question of security council reform it would be instructive for anyone interested to go to the website of the permanent mission of india new york and find the first speech it's called under the landmark documents uh, <coughs> menu the first speech of 1946 that india made in the general assembly on the 18th of january and it was made by sir ramaswamy mudaliar who actually had signed the un charter on behalf of india so it was a person who knew what he was going to talk about and he said very clearly that the veto power was not agreed to by india and by many other countries but we were asked to accept the compromise on the understanding that within 10 years of the signing of the un charter the provisions of the charter would be reviewed and the veto would no longer be required and that is in ramaswamy mudaliar's own words and you know i think that we need to actually remember our own policy on un security council reform starting from that speech and the speech in the subsequent year given by vijay lakshmi pandit which is what did india expect from the united nations and she said it in her own uh, she was a very good uh, articulate speaker and she said that uh, india needs to feed and clothe her population and that is what we need the united nations for to help us to 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 remove poverty to feed our people and and and, and to and to realize socio economic progress so th these continue to be the 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 main objectives of uh, of uh, security council reform to make it uh, more democratic more transparent and more representative so that its decisions are implemented on the ground Th that that is the mandate for the security council reform or and that's a unanimous mandate you know i mean so i find that there's a double standard at work 2005 all world leaders agreed to give this mandate for security council reform to make its decisions implemented on the ground i mean that's the language of that summit in 2005 and yet today in 2021 we are still going around and round this issue of security council reform and the answer again is on all the five permanent members they don't want it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh so my last question to you will be uh, to understand not just the un processes but where do you think this war is headed um there are this three rounds of peace talks that have happened do you see any kind of way out or do you think this is something that russia and ukraine have to sort out bilaterally uh, other countries can do as much in terms of imposing sanctions isolate russia but will that really help in ending the war well you know in all conflicts like this especially when you have to go back to where the conflict originated from and this conflict originated from within the sovereign country of ukraine which is a member of the united nations so it is for ukraine to resolve this conflict through the political settlement which it has to which it was committed to doing it signed an agreement which was endorsed by the security council called the minsk agreement the minsk agreement gives you a clear framework of what was required to be done by ukraine now if that was not done and ukraine did something else which uh, is being discussed i mean how they did not fulfill the minsk agreement then the solution to the conflict will have to go back to to that point but i think that today uh, given the the response that has taken place to the uh, invasion of ukraine 
the the solution of this conflict will also have to bring in the the larger issues because as you said financial sanctions have been uh, to put it the other way economic measures have been weaponized uh, we are living in a globalized world so there's an integration of all countries through the global system i mean i have negotiated the financial services uh, liberalization in the world trade organization all the banking systems of the world were integrated were were interlinked so today to use that interlinkage and weaponize it is uh, is uh, probably not in the minds of the people who negotiated the globalization process so we'll have to bring that uh, into the solution because how will we prevent a group of uh, powerful countries from using their position of dominating the financial system to impose their will through unilateral sanctions on everybody else especially when the world is coming out of the covid pandemic i mean you know th this impact will be felt on many countries including countries of central asia all the central asian uh, uh, population is working as expatriate workers in russia how will they be paid uh, for the work they do if the banking systems are, are cut i mean these are issues which have never been discussed even in the un general assembly these discussions haven't taken place let alone in the security council so we'll have to bring this and of course the set of issues relating to security i think on that there is uh, not much discussion but i think it's uh, uh, worth a discussion because what has happened to the security architecture of europe uh, which was uh, guaranteed by the helsinki final act of 1975 carried forward by the uh, nato russia uh, founding act of 1997 and uh, consolidated into a charter of the osce adopted in istanbul in 1999 what has happened to that architecture and why is today that uh, architecture considered to be uh either irrelevant or uh, not in keeping with uh, the security interests of all the members of this european uh, space because of one fact and that is that technological developments have have ensured that whatever is uh, threatening the security of europe will have an impact on the rest of the world and especially if you're looking at nuclear weapons so uh, we the rest of the world cannot be kept out of the eventual resolution of whatever happens uh, on the ukraine uh, uh, crisis because the security of uh, dimension of that uh, resolution will have an impact on all the other countries in the world and especially countries like india which are uh, considered to be uh, major military uh, powers and we have uh, one of the largest armies in the world etc cetera, etc cetera. so we, we 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 may not match the united states but we are not very far Uh, away from them either in terms of our own uh, uh, military footprint so uh, these include issues like ballistic missiles nuclear warheads etc on which india as a nuclear weapon state has has very clear interest so we will have to put all this into the basket of the compromise that uh, will have to be sustained for peace to return to ukraine mm -hmm. so then just just one last thing Do you talk about the Minsk agreements? Do you think the uh, Europe will still be open to negotiating them? Because the voices that we hear from Europe is that Russia has ripped apart all those agreements, uh, so it has to first stop the war and then we'll go for another settlement. How do you think? Do you think this has messed up the entire situation in that manner? Well, I think it depends on how you approach international relations, uh, because the the main uh, principles are that there has to be stability and predictability. now if the intention is that we, sign, we that no one force people to sign that agreement and they signed voluntarily and they got it ratified and not only that they brought it to the security council for endorsement so therefore there was some thinking on it it's, it's not that they, these agreements were signed at gunpoint and you know that uh, they don't have any value if they were adopted as, as a security council resolution given what i have told you about the the legal status of security council resolutions in the charter of the united nations you cannot just uh, tear them up and throw them away so if for example if you are following an approach on the iran nuclear issue uh, the joint uh, jcpoa the joint comprehensive program of action which was also uh, entered into uh, by a group of countries but brought and endorsed by the united nations security council now for that there is an ongoing process of trying to implement the jcpoa even after donald trump came and went but why is that same approach not being applied to the minsk agreement this is a question i keep asking and there's no one answering that 
and the agreement is guaranteed by one permanent member of the security by two permanent members of the security council uh, france and russia right. so they have to uh, because otherwise what is their responsibility as permanent members if they guarantee an agreement which cannot be sustained on the ground so i think that that is the issue it's not that the minsk agreement has to be thrown out why, why should the minsk agreement have to be thrown why was it signed in the first place is the question that right. the rest of the world will answer Sure, sir. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for giving us your time and thank you for clearing out certain doubts. Uh, you please take care, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. You to look after yourself. It was nice uh, to be able to have this interaction. Thank you.